Welcome to Direct U.S. Immigration's channel, where you get direct access to our most up-to-date immigration and global mobility space. My name is Matreya Brown, and I'm going to talk about applying for a green card after a visa overstay. You're not going to want to miss out on this one. Stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Matreya Brown and I am a U.S. immigration attorney based in Washington, D.C. I am also the principal attorney at Direct U.S. Immigration, where we work with clients in all 50 states and around the world. Before we start, click on the like and subscribe button to follow our immigration hub to get the latest immigration information that could be vital to your case. And also, be sure to stick around until the end to get bonus information on those who are not eligible for adjustment of status. Questions I will sometimes receive include, can I apply for a green card after a visa overstay? Or what happens if my visa expires and I'm married to a U.S. citizen? The people asking these questions are concerned with obtaining legal status in the United States despite a period of unlawful presence. Only certain people can obtain a green card after a visa overstay while other individuals can create long-term immigration problems by applying for immigration benefits after a visa overstay. To explain who is eligible to apply for a green card after an overstay, it's essential to get a picture of the entire landscape. First, it's important to define what a visa overstay means because it's not as obvious as many think. So when a foreign national remains in the United States longer than the authorized stay, it's called overstaying a visa. An overstay includes a non-immigrant visa holder who was lawfully admitted to the United States for an authorized period, but stayed beyond his or her authorized admission period. Also, the U.S. government will also consider non-immigrants admitted for duration of status who fail to maintain their status and overstay. Duration of status is a term used for foreign nationals admitted for a duration of a specific program or activity which may be variable instead of for a set time frame. The authorized admission period ends when the foreign national accomplishes the purpose for which they were admitted or is no longer engaged in authorized activities. So for example, an international student on an F-1 visa who enters the U.S. for a program that runs for four years must leave when the program is completed or pursue another program of study. Don't refer to your visa alone for the expiration information. A non-immigrant visa may be valid for several years. However, the visa does not govern the length of your authorized stay in the U.S. It merely allows you to enter the United States during that period. Instead, your Form I-94, uh, which is the Arrival Departure Record, governs your authorized stay in the United States. The Admit Until date on your I-94 record is the last day you are permitted to remain in the United States and it may not be valid for as long as the visa is valid. You must depart the U.S. by the date on Form I-94 or you will have an overstay on the visa. It's helpful to understand the 3 and 10 year bars. In 1996, Congress passed a law that bars certain individuals who have accumulated a period of unlawful presence in the U.S. from becoming U.S. permanent residents. Unlawful presence includes any time spent in the United States by a foreign national who either entered the United States without inspection and admission or parole, or whose lawful immigration status expired or was rescinded, revoked, or otherwise terminated. Thus, any time spent in the U.S. beyond what is authorized on an I-94 record, so results in a visa overstay, is a period of unlawful presence. The period of unlawful presence begins on the day that the status expires. But these bars are only triggered once the individual leaves the United States. So the three and 10 year bars break down as follows. So persons who have, who have accumulated 180 days or more of unlawful presence and have then left the country cannot return to the United States for three years. Now, persons who have accumulated one year or more of unlawful presence and have then left the country cannot return to the United States for 10 years. Now, it is possible in certain circumstances to obtain a waiver for a bar to re-entry. 
However, there's a high standard to prove that the U.S. citizen spouse would suffer extreme hardship if the waiver is not granted. So we highly recommend using an experienced immigration attorney to request this waiver. This process is complicated and gets expensive. Now there is another solution for immigrant relatives of U.S. citizens who have not yet departed the United States. So by returning to the home country to undergo consular processing for a green card, intending immigrants with a significant period of unlawful presence will trigger a bar to re-entry. In the best cases, this will be an expensive and time-consuming process that requires the assistance of a lawyer. In the worst cases, the result could be catastrophic to the family and immigration process. But immediate relatives of U.S. citizens presently inside the U.S. through lawful entry may be eligible to adjust his status to a permanent resident or green card holder. The typical family-based adjustment of status package includes the following forms. So Form I-130, which is the Petition for an Alien Relative, Form I-130A, which is the Supplemental Information for the Spouse Beneficiary, and of course this is if your beneficiary is your spouse. Um, third is the I, uh, Form I-45, which is the Application to Register Permanent Residence or Adjust Status. Uh, fourth is I-864, uh, which is the Affidavit of Support the I-693, which is the report of medical examination and vaccination record, and then you know your optional I-765, which is the employment authorization, as well as the optional I-131, which is the application for a travel document. USCIS vigilantly reviews cases for any immigration fraud. So remember that virtually every U.S. non-immigrant visa is temporary and has a specific purpose. When you do things outside of the scope of that visa, there is a potential for violating the terms of the visa and even becoming accused of fraud or misrepresentation. Now, there are two types of fraud typically associated with obtaining a green card through marriage, and the two include visa fraud and marriage fraud. So with visa fraud, misrepresenting the reasons for requesting a particular type of visa is a form of visa fraud. So if you visit the U.S. on a visitor visa, so you know, a B-1, B-2 visa, with the secret intention of getting married, you will have committed visa fraud. So your intent is a central focus here. So the B-2 tourist visa is specifically for people who intend to stay temporarily and then return home. Someone who plans to marry and then remain in the United States violates the term of that visa. So visa fraud can result in losing the right to obtain a green card. Now, marriage fraud is when at least one of the parties of the marriage enters into the marriage to circumvent immigration laws to acquire an immigration benefit falsely. So in other words, the individual is basically just getting married to obtain a green card, um, and that is considered a clear case of fraud. Marriage fraud results in steep penalties, including jail time and fines. Furthermore, fraud makes obtaining a future green card application approval exceedingly difficult. And there is a burden of proof on the couple to prove that the marriage is bona fide or true on the I-130 petition. So as promised, here's some bonus information that you may not know about. As discussed above, immediate relatives may adjust their status after overstaying their visa if they entered lawfully. Though persons in the family preference category who do not enter lawfully or entered lawfully and overstayed but are married to a green card holder are in a more difficult position. So generally, the latter group of individuals may not adjust their status due to this violation. And once they depart the U.S. to complete the process through the consulate or embassy, they may also be barred from re-entry due to the three-year or ten-year bars. Now, certain individuals in the family preference category may qualify for a provisional waiver obtained through Form I-601A to remove the three-year or ten-year bar. I hope you found this video helpful. Subscribe if this content or information helps you in any way. Comment below if you want me to talk about something in specific. And share this resource widely because you never know who needs answers to these questions. Additionally, if you have specific questions about this video as they pertain to your unique circumstances, please schedule a consultation with us also at the link below, and I'll see you in the next video.